Hey everyone, well, it's the holiday season, which means it's time for me to finally fulfill some people's wishes this week here on the Classic Review. I have stayed away mostly from the in-your-house pay-per-views the WWF started putting out in the mid-1990s for, you know, various reasons, but I figure now, since it is December, let's turn the clock back and go to the first ever December in-your-house pay-per-view, and of course it would be a show that gave promoters all over the country tons of inspiration for years to come on how to name their December shows. I'm talking about In Your House 5, retroactively titled Seasons Beatings from December 17, 1995 at Hershey Park Arena in Hershey, Pennsylvania. This show was nominated by Michael Flores over on Patreon.com slash Wrestling With Regret. Christmas, the time to come together, but the Hart family is once again broken. Two men stand apart, one family stands divided. This is the final pay-per-view of 1995 for the WWF. Like I said, 95 was a really rough year in a lot of ways. A lot of crappy gimmicks and a lot of crappy angles. Uh, the debut of Nitro was happening in WCW, which really put the WWF uh, on their heels a little bit. There was a lot working against them in 95. And I'll tell you what, this show right here is indicative of that. This show only drew 80,000 pay-per-view buys, which is not only the lowest figure of 95, but from what I can tell, it's the lowest figure ever. You know, just looking at all the different different pay-per-views across the decades before it went to the network model where you can't really see how many people are individually watching the shows. 80,000 is pretty sparse, but it's important to remember that the In Your House shows around this time were only two hours instead of three for traditional pay-per-views, and they were also at a lower price point, so I don't consider it a huge blow to them that they only drew 80,000 buys for this show. It's the end of the year. People's pricing habits, their spending habits, I should say, are a little different at the end of the year, so not not a huge shock this one didn't draw a whole lot. There's about 7,300 folks in attendance in Hershey. Also, if you notice, there's a sizable ECW fan contingent at this show as well. Vince McMahon and Jerry King, Jerry the Lawler on the call tonight. They're asking, what about Brett versus Bulldog? What about Santa? You see Santa Claus handing out gifts alongside the smoking guns. The King says he's got a big surprise for everyone tonight. Oh boy, I can't wait. Next here comes one of Vince McMahon's most timely references considering the time period as he describes Ted DiBiase as the personification of Scrooge McDuck. Well, there was an old WWF comic book that showed Ted doing that big dive into the vault, so maybe there's more to it than you think. He is a bit short on adventuring, though. Your opening contest sees the new team of Sid and the Kid, that's 1-2-3-Kid, taking on Razor Ramon and Marty Jannetty. Oh my god, can you imagine the shit those two in particular got into after shows during this time period? Putting them in a tag team feels like a recipe for disaster. Anyway, the 1-2-3-Kid has turned his back on his good friend Razor. He took the money and has joined the Million Dollar Corporation. At Survivor Series, Sid helped Kid eliminate Janetti, and then later in the night in the wildcard match, Kid helped get Ramon eliminated. Hey, look in the crowd there. That's Gold Dust. What's he doing out there looking at Razor Ramon so longingly like? Janetti and the Kid start things off with some quick action. Kid is soon confronted by Razor finally. He can't get away at first, but he gets a blind tag to Sid, a lovely cut off by the baddies. Razor is blatantly double teamed. The referee does nothing. There's big Sid chance from the audience. Man, for a guy who was booked a lot of the time in his career as a heel, through all, the, all these different time periods I see him, People love their Sid. Big double clothesline leaves both of the bigger men down. We get a double hot tag to Kid and Janetti. And while Marty slows things down, we suddenly go to Todd Pettengill on a split screen sitting with gold dust. He quotes the graduate and can't stop being effusive and complimentary to Razor Ramon's physique and appearance and masculinity. He asks Todd to deliver a golden envelope to the bad guy, which Pettengill says he will do. Hey, is there a match going on now or what? Janetti with a big crossbody to Sid. More heel shenanigans with the referee's back turn, Kid with a big frog splash off the top. Marty takes a lot of punishment, but dodges Kid throwing himself crotch first at him in the corner, allowing him to tag Razor back in, throwing Kid into Sid at one point. Hits a bulldog off the second rope on Sid, the cover, and the win. Oh, that seemed kind of abrupt. After the bell, Razor tries to hit his edge on the Kid, but Sid yoinks his partner out of danger. 
I give it three stars out of five. I was pretty uh, impressed with this opening contest. Like two teams I don't really give much thought to, but I think that it was a good continuation of all the respective storylines with the kid and Razor. You're starting to plant the seeds for, you know, what's happening with Goldust and Razor Ramon in this one. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was overall a fine match. People complain about Marty Jannetty at this time, saying he's not as fast as he was. And like, yeah, that's true here, but I still don't think he was bad. Up next, the ring announcer starts calling for Nature Boy Buddy Rydell. Then suddenly Jerry Lawler interrupts because the guy's jumping his cue. Jerry's in the ring now with a wrapped up frame and he's got his special guest, Double J, Jeff Jarrett, who's back for the first time in the company since the In Your House in July, where he dropped the Intercontinental title to Shawn Michaels and he and the roadie walked out of the Federation to go back to Memphis for a little bit. You know, say what you will about Jarrett as a wrestler, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Speaking of Memphis, we do get a a bit of a Memphis reunion here with Lawler and Jarrett in there. Ha ha ha, I is great. He says he's getting ready for his greater than great tour when Jerry presents his gift to celebrate 500,000 sales of his previous hit record. It's his own gold CD. Jarrett is very happy about this gift saying it's the culmination of his Ain't I Great tour. Talks about all the stuff he's accomplished since coming to the Federation, just not lately. He says the final touches are being made to his new album and also announces himself as the first official participant in next year's Royal Rumble match. Lawler asks Jared to join him at the announced desk with McMahon because it's almost like talking to himself. So now what we're supposed to get at this point in the show is Ahmed Johnson taking on Dean Douglas, the evil heel teacher played by Shane Douglas. They've been building to this for weeks, but now suddenly we see Dean coming out in his gear but saying he is unable to compete. He says he's being sidelined because his back is only 65%. Wow, Shane Douglas is injured and unable to wrestle? Say it ain't so! So he brings out his graduate student as a replacement, the nature boy, Buddy Ride, I mean Landell. So that ring announcer got fired, right? And to really hit you over the head with how much of a knockoff Landell is here, he comes out to Ric Flair's old WWF theme. Ahmed is all business and not all knee and elbow pads yet. Jarrett on commentary is like, he just wears tights to the ring? Like, he's surprised by that. Like, Jarrett, you're in wrestling. You're telling me you've never seen a guy just wearing trunks? Landell begins with some cheap shots, but Ahmed registers none of it, just overpowering the nature boy, gets him up for the Pearl River plunge and the win, and Jarrett just remains flabbergasted by Ahmed's mere presence. Ahmed whips Dean Douglas with his board of education afterward for good measure. I give it a half star out of five. Boy, you love seeing jobber squash matches happening on the show you paid to see. Uh, always great. But as far as uh, Dean Douglas goes, this would be his last appearance in the World Wrestling Federation. The injury did continue. He was let go from his contract at the end of the year. And that really began his whole, well, that was a part, a contributing factor, let's just say, to his whole origin story for the character he would portray in ECW when he came back. The combination of how he was treated in the WWF and how he felt he was treated in WCW. W in his previous runs, uh, all going into Shane's character he would soon kind of uh, form in ECW. As far as Ahmed Johnson though, his night is not over yet. Afterward, the king is back on the live mic, wants to interview the winner. He stalls to get the camera on his good side, he says. Then he asks Jarrett if he thought Ahmed looked impressive. Jarrett says no. Lawler starts mocking Johnson and calling him dumb and Jarrett just cheers him on. <laughs> Great king, you got him. Hey, I said this about Jarrett recently in AEW and it holds true. Wrestling just always needs cackling idiot heels. Ahmed has finally had enough. He calls Jarrett an achy, breaky heart wannabe. He turns his back to him, which is his undoing, as Jarrett lays him out with the gold CD. But look at how stiff that looked. There's no gimmick in that picture frame at all, it would seem. They beat the hell out of Ahmed for a second. Then Jarrett gets in the ring to grab the Board of Education, specifically to hit Ahmed in the ass, which then wakes Ahmed up. Then they have an awkward chase fight up the ramp and through the curtain. It was really weird. I will say, it was kind of a neat way to transition Ahmed from one storyline line to the next. Like, hey, this Dean Douglas one is completely flattened out. Jeff Jarrett's brought back in. Let's put these two together. This segment, if you look at the entirety of everything from Lawler interrupting the ring announcer to this, it is a pretty long segment for a pay-per-view. It's mostly promo, punctuated in the middle with a squash match, um, but it does a good job, like I said, in changing the story from Ahmed going to Douglas to Jarrett. And we will see them have their match at the Royal Rumble the following month, which does end in a DQ 
for Ahmed winning. The Toddsters back in the AOL zone with Razor Ramon. He congratulates him on the match earlier, talks about his upcoming Intercontinental title match against Yokozuna the next night on Raw. Razor cuts a quick promo, then Todd hands Razor the golden envelope and takes his leave. Razor opens and reads the love letter inside, looking visibly angered and disgusted and storms off. See y'all at the Rumble! In our next matchup, the undefeated Blue Blood, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, takes on his natural opponent, a hog farmer. It's the hog pen match as Triple H takes on Henry O. Godwin with Hillbilly Jim as the guest referee. We got the hog pen set up by the stage. The first man who goes into it is the loser. Godwin comes to the ring with a pair of big slop buckets. He chases Hunter around the ring, goes to slop him, but Helmsley using Tony Chimmel as a human shield. That poor young man, says Vince. The match finally kicks off in the ring, H-Man tied up in the ropes, which allows Henry to grab a handful of slop and rub it right in Helmsley's face. Hunter takes control soon after that. On the outside, Helmsley is rammed headfirst into the steel steps, but they could have picked a better camera angle. Godwin picks him up and brings him closer to the hog pen. This gives the hog man the home pen advantage. Fighting near the pen, H throws Henry into the fence, goes for a pedigree, but almost gets backdropped into the pen as a result. He lands on the wall, though, hits a cactus elbow drop off of it, though. We go back to the ring for more wrestling. Big wheelbarrow slam by Godwin. Hunter with a big flippy bump in the corner, another one on the outside. They make their way back to the hog pen. Slop drop connects on the padding. Henry goes in for the kill, but Helmsley back drops him right into the pig shit. Helmsley wins the match, remains undefeated, but then he gets into a shoving match with Hillbilly Jim and then thrown into the pen as a result. Godwin slamming him into the shit multiple times to great comedic effect. You know what's not funny though, is that you can see halfway through here, Triple H gets a big old gash on his back. And what happened was when he was thrown back first into that metal door for the hog pen, it cut open his back. And then you see him take bump after bump in the mud and pig shit. I can only assume, since he is alive and with us today, that they did a really good job cleaning up that wound. Also, seeing him flick the shit everywhere as he's slipping around and bumping is hilarious and gross at the same time. I'll give it two stars out of five. You know, for a hog pen match, all told, I was pretty entertained by it. I did think it was a little extra for them to go like back into the ring and do a whole other sequence considering the whole points to be like at the hog pen when they both just want to be there for a long time. I don't know. But besides that, uh, it's funny to me that this match is often lumped in with the narrative of Triple H after the curtain call being punished for that moment. This takes place months before the curtain call. It has nothing to do with his supposed punishment that he suffered in 1996. The real extent of it was he just didn't get king of the ring. That was pretty much the biggest problem I think that came uh, as far as punishment was with Triple H. Uh, this hog pen match, nothing to do with it. But also another funny story about this this hog pen match was after the show, Owen Hart pulled a nice rib on everyone and redirected the pigs into Vincent Mann's office for a while after the show. Oh, classic Owen. And speaking of the rocket, we go to that next match now as Owen Hart takes on Big Daddy Culotta Diesel. Last month of Survivor Series, Diesel lost the title to Bret Hart, ending his year-long reign and turned heel kinda. The next night on Raw, Diesel said he's tired of acting corporate and phony, says he's going back to being the old Diesel and says he will still fist pound the fans, but there'd better be a glove on the other end. So not a full heel, but Diesel is really, I think, one of the biggest high profile tweeners at this point in the company, especially when we are starting to dip our toe into the whole shades of gray sort of thing that really helps define a lot of what becomes the Attitude Era. Meanwhile, Diesel's good friend Shawn Michaels has a bit of the old bad brain lately. A lot of head injuries over the last couple of months, that bar fight in Syracuse, falling on his noggin in matches, finally becomes too much much on an episode of Raw when HBK passes out mid-match with Owen and now the Rocket taking credit for the injury. A lot of questions as to whether or not Sean will come back. They do this whole big storyline of him, you know, being interviewed and when the topic of retirement comes to mind, he's visibly shaken and frustrated. He gets mad and kind of lashes out at Pettengill. Owen's issued an open challenge for the pay-per-view and Diesel's answered the call. By the way, I love Jim Cornette's Santa-themed tennis racket here. Diesel off to a hot start as Cornette can only look on. Owen ducks the boot and begins to mount an offensive, going after the leg. Diesel powers out, though, hits a jackknife before saying, this is for you, Sean, goes for a foot on the chest, but won't let the three count happen. He shoves Tim White out of the way, which gets him disqualified. Diesel hits another power bomb just to make a point. I'll give it one and a half stars out of five. The angle is the story here. It's not really much of a match. Further just showing how much of this, you know, badass Diesel is now. He's mad. 
he's motivated, and he's willing to take out anybody, especially the ones who beat up his friends. But yeah, as far as the match goes, you know, there's not much to it. It seems like a weird trend that I've noticed just watching Kevin Nash matches. I mean, for him to kind of walk away from easily winnable matches for no reason. You know, I've seen it twice lately, which isn't saying a lot, but it's weird that it's happened more than once. Santa Claus is back out with Savio Vega as Ted DiBiase is in the ring now. He says everybody has a price for the million dollar man, even you, Savio. Come on to the ring so I can buy you here. Ted also complaining that he just cannot believe that Santa Claus is real. I mean, that guy flying around the world in one night, it's ridiculous. Ted, let me remind you who you're employed for here. You've probably seen some more outlandish shit than Santa Claus. Savio accusing DiBiase of trying to ruin the magic of Santa Claus, saying, see Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Well, believe this. Santa Claus jumps Vega. It becomes a two-on-one beatdown. The heels go to leave, but Savio catches up. He unmasks Santa, and it's a young Balls Mahoney, but we don't know who that is yet, so it's just some guy. It's actually Santa's evil brother, Santa Claus, who lives in the South Pole. This was a very silly segment, and it was also not very good. Uh, you know, it's kind of tying, it feels to me like kind of a connection with like the gobbledygooker at Survivor Series 90, where it's like, hey, a big holiday is right around the corner. Let's tie in with that with some holiday themed wrestler with a very short window of relevancy. That'll work. I'm not sure where they expected Santa Claus to go after this, but it was a very short run for the Young Balls Mahoney because apparently like the same week he debuted this character, he also picked a fight backstage with George the Animal Steel over money. And that was the end of Balls Mahoney's time in the WWF for many years until the ECW rebrand. Coming up next is a casket match as King Mabel takes on The Undertaker. Mabel is the only one who's pinned The Undertaker in a long time. He laid him out and injured his face, so he had to wear that phantom mask for a while, and lest we forget, he is carrying the chains which have the remnants of the Undertaker's urn that was melted down earlier in the year by Kama Mustafa. So Mabel's got all this heat for everything he's done against the dead man, but of course, he's a big fat guy in wrestling, and the one thing that they're terrified of more than anything else is caskets. As Mabel makes his entrance, Doc Hendricks plugs the new WrestleMania arcade game for the SNES, Genesis, and PS1. Call now, we'll throw in the strategy guide VHS. By the way, speaking of that tape, you can check out my review of the WrestleMania, the arcade game strategy guide VHS. I did many years ago with Tony Pizza Guy right here. Mabel coming out with Sir Mo. They've got those remnants of the urn and the chains. What is that haircut though on Mabel's head though? There's no form to it or anything. Taker takes some big moves from the king, but he keeps sitting up. Up, including while Mabel goes for a big dive off the second rope. A distraction by Mo allows Mabel to gain the advantage. He splats the dead man, and now Sir Mo carrying Taker over his shoulder to try and throw him into the casket. They forget to close it though. They do a lot of stalling, and then when they finally go back to it, the dead man is able to dramatically stop it, and he comes back. Taker with the big lariat and the big choke slam, better than the one he gave Hogan in 02. Mabel is knocked into the casket, and things look to be over, but Mo runs in to fight as well. The Undertaker is unfazed, choke slams Mo. Man, with all those chains around his neck, that had to have hurt. He gets rolled into the casket as well, and before shutting the lid, Taker reclaims what's left of the urn, slams the lid, and he wins. I give it two and a half stars out of five. For me, this felt like a perfectly good Undertaker versus Monster gimmick match. You know, that kind of formula. I think it worked here. You know, say what you will about Mabel as a worker. He did have a bad reputation during this time for hurting wrestlers, but when he's not doing that, I think he can be impressive. And I think that he was a good foil for Taker here. And I think that, uh, yeah, it felt like a very good logical conclusion to the end of their feud. Jim Ross is backstage. He gives us a recap of the main event of SummerSlam 92. Brett versus Bulldog, Wembley Stadium. Diana Hart Smith watching on. But that family togetherness at the end of the match will not be here tonight. You got Jim Cornette, the Bulldog, and Diana entering the room. Cornette saying that Brett's been jealous of Davey Boy since first laying eyes on him in 1981. He took your dad's love from you, Brett. He took your spot. He took your sister. He took your intercontinental title. And tonight it's going to be a clean sweep when he beats you again. JR asking to Diana, if there are any mixed emotions like in 92, but she's like, nope, fuck Brett. Davey's gonna win whether he wants to or not. Bulldog wraps it up by saying the belt rightfully belongs around his waist. Elsewhere, Todd's with the champion Brett Hart. How is he preparing? He says he's had to live with SummerSlam for years and that tonight revenge is his and the Bulldog is going down. 
So we go now to that main event for the World Wrestling Federation Championship as the new champ, Bret the Hitman Hart, defends against his brother-in-law, Davey Boy Smith, the British Bulldog. No angsty family tension now, no face versus face, it's just Bulldog hates Bret now. There's good back and forth, good grabs to start things off, nice little slide through Bulldog's legs under the ropes to evade. Bulldog takes over, hangs Bret upside down, and just lays into him. We also hear a faint EC dub chant as this match goes on. Again, we are in Pennsylvania, very much in ECW country. I mentioned at the top of the show, there was a bit of that fan contingent, and we really hear it a lot in this matchup, I feel. Also, maybe Dean Douglas heard the chant backstage and gave himself some ideas. Cornette jabs Brett in the throat with a racket handle. Get out of my face, I didn't do nothing. As the match goes on, Vince announcing the Undertaker will challenge the winner of this title match at the Royal Rumble. He hits a snug looking pile driver on Bulldog. Lawler shouts, he learned that from me. We get a kick out. Superplex attempt turns into Brett crotching himself in a major way on the ropes. On the outside, Bulldog hits Brett, who falls face first into the steel steps and is now a gushing. We get a he's hardcore chant from the ECW fans in attendance. Big pile driver to the champ who kicks out. Brett's bleeding so much, Vince on commentary openly saying, let's keep the wide shots so we don't need to see it. I kind of like how Vince is doing that. Bulldog with a bow and arrow lock, but Brett just rolls out of it and tries the sharpshooter to a big pop. Davy Boy escapes. Brett with a beautiful counter out of a vertical suplex attempt. The big double clothesline leads to a double down. Brett launching Davey outside, then launching himself off the ropes, but Bulldog catches him, hits the power slam on the floor. Brett reversing a suplex attempt on the concrete. Bulldog crotch on the barricade. Back in the ring, Bulldog is thrown into the corner and he bounces and lands right on his head. Damn. We get a superplex, then Brett hits a nice looking cradle. The cover, the win. Brett retains the championship. No post-match shenanigans here. Bulldog just hugs his wife Diana and they walk to the back to lick their wounds. I give it four and a half stars out of five. This, you know, this match does not quite live up to the lofty, lofty standards of 92 and Wembley, but it is still an excellent match nonetheless. It absolutely saves this show. It is the best match of the night. I always love, you know, Bret Hart historically kind of picked and chose when he or his opponents would bleed. It was always very judicious and it always felt right. And what I think was also very fascinating about it was in his autobiography, he would talk about doing stuff like that. And even Vincent Mann, never really sure if uh, it was a working gig or if it was hard way, that sort of thing. But yeah, this was a fantastic matchup here. I mean, like Bulldog rarely looks as good anywhere else as he does when he wrestles Brett really brought the best out of him as a wrestler. And like I said, this definitely saved the show in many respects. If you watch one match on this show, it's got to be this. But then as the show is wrapping up, we see a backstage interview with The Undertaker when Diesel walks in and says he deserves the next title shot, not the dead man. They have a stare down as we plant the seeds for their match at WrestleMania 12. My grade for In Your House 5, parentheses, seasons, beatings, is a C plus. Look, Brett and Bulldog, Awesome match. Like I said, it's the one match in this thing worth watching. And I will give them a lot of credit on this show because they do a lot of good work, not only concluding certain storylines, but also jumping off to new ones. We see a lot of that in this show, and I think that is really commendable. But a lot of the matches themselves just aren't that interesting. Uh, you know, you've got the Santa Claus or the Santa Claus debut with uh, DiBiase was weird. Ahmed and Buddy Landell as a match. Just, eh, you know, why even bring Buddy out if you're going to have him do that? Eh. It's an okay show, just in the middle for me when you kind of look at the sum of its parts. And, uh, you know, you can see they're trying to right the ship from 95. Things are slowly at a glacial pace kind of going in that positive direction of 96. Don't worry. Steve Austin and Mick Foley are coming very soon. You don't have to worry much longer. But, yeah, this is just kind of a so-so way to end the year. But what did you think of In Your House 5, folks? What did you think of this review? Let me hear about it in the comment section below. Give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret if you haven't yet. Hit that bell icon for all the notifications. And hey, you're going to want those notifications because December is going to be a big month here at Regret. We're going to give you CM Punk and AEW. We're going to give you a countdown about the biggest surprises in wrestling, which may or may not include CM Punk and Survivor Series. And of course, uh, the classic reviews continue on. And in two weeks from now, we're going back to the year 2000 for WCW. Oh, it's Christmas all over again because I'm covering Starcade 2000. What's the worst that could happen? I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.